Good evening, everyone. I was looking for Father, so I finally found him. I think he's hiding over there, so, but you'll see him in just a minute. And Father, when you come forward, if you'd lead us in prayer when you come up here, uh, Father uh, Giuseppe, or Joseph, as he's called here in the United States, Cardamone, uh, is with the Missionary Servants of the Poor, is from Calabria, Italy, and he studied biomedical engineering at Rome University. It was while he was completing these studies that he discerned his vocation to the priesthood. He joined the Missionary Servants of the Poor in 1999 and was ordained a priest in 2005. He studied ecclesiology at Lateran University in Rome, and after completing those studies, he served as formator at the House of Formation until 2018. Currently, he serves as administrator of the La Santa Cruz Parish in Cuba, he has been a guest speaker on EWTN and various other Catholic media outlets. And Father Cardamone, along with other two other priests, serve an area of more than 80 villages and 90,000 people. Currently, he is overseeing a project of renovating their 19th century church after the roof collapsed 10 years ago. Not a simple task in any country, but much more difficult in Cuba. It is fascinating to hear the struggles of obtaining materials needed as there are no home depots in Cuba. And some material comes from tearing down old buildings and reusing the metal from those buildings. He and his brother priest are undaunted as they know that the church is not just a building, it is a sign of hope to the people of Cuba, reminding them that Christ is the only hope for Cuba. So, so now I would like to introduce Father Joseph. He's visiting here also. You'll see Brother John hiding around over here. So if you see Brother John, um, you can, uh, if you speak French, that would be helpful. He's a Frenchman. So we have a Frenchman and an Italian with us. The Universal Church is with us. And, and just on a personal note, I had uh, met uh, uh, two priests, Father, and, and another priest uh, with the uh, missionary servants of the poor, I was very impressed uh, both with their service to the poorest of the poor, the generous service that they offered, but also with the deep love they had and reverence they had with the holy sacrifice of the Mass, that they combined two elements that certainly are important to me as a pastor. Um, so I look forward to hearing his words, and the topic uh, is one that I find very interesting and very intriguing, and I hope you do too. So let us welcome Father as he is here to visit with us and to serve us during this mission. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Veni, Sante Spiritus, reprecorda tuorum fidelium, et ignamoris tui sine is accende, emite spiritum tuum, et creabuntur. Renovabis facem terre oremus, Deus qui corda fidelium. Santi Spiritus, illustrazione d'oquisti, da nobis in odem spiritu recta sapere, Ed eiu sempre consolazione gaudere per undem Christum dominum nostrum. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> Dear brothers and sisters, first of all, thank you <coughs> for the invitation. Thank, thanks to Father Jack, Father Brian, Father uh, Kevin, <laughs> and all of you. And I'm very glad to be here, and um, I hope that um, my sharing, this is just a sharing that, about something that is very much at heart, I have very much in my heart. So it's a sharing something that I, I feel very, very much important uh, because maybe I suffer for it. And um, I want to share this, won't be to, uh, to share new things. In Latin we say, not nova ut sciatis, but vetera ut faciatis, which means I won't tell you new things that you will increase your knowledge, but I'll tell you old things so that you would put it into, into practice. So, first of all, I, want all, I would like also to quote the imitation of Christ. This is a quotation that 
I always use at the beginning of retreats of talks that sometimes I deliver. Book three, chapter two. Truth speaks inwardly without the sounds of words. This is a, a quotation that refers to the prophets or the preachers. They indeed utter fine words, but they cannot impart the spirit. They do indeed speak beautifully, but if you remain silent, they cannot inflame the heart. They deliver the message, you lay bare the sense. They place before us mysteries, but you unlock the meaning. They proclaim commandments, you help us to keep them. They point out the way, you give strength for the journey. They work only outwardly, you instruct and enlighten our hearts. They water on the outside, you give the increase. They carry out words, you give understanding to the hearer. It means that we entrust all the fruits of these souls to the Holy Spirit. He is the one who is in charge of making those talks not just informative, but performative, which means that help us to grow in the knowledge of God. Because as the famous Aristotle said, that a tiny knowledge of God is worth any, an increase of knowledge about God is worth any, any amount of other knowledge. And also, whenever we deepen in the mystery of God, as the, the initial prayer said, we rejoice of it. We pray the Lord to make us know and deepen into his mystery so that we can rejoice of it. We have the great advantage that the Lord is with us. I'm so glad that we are delivering talks in the church. I feel very comfortable with the Holy Eucharist. And also we have just celebrated the Paschal mystery the mystery of our faith, and actually these talks are very much about that because it is the Paschal mystery that uh, shapes, strengthens, and uh, renovates constantly our identity. So uh, I would like to bring to you, first of all, a positive, brotherly, and realistic gaze on the church that is based on the contemplation, first of all, on the contemplation of the beauty of the Eucharist, on the contemplation of the perfection and beauty of the deposit of the faith, of our faith, and also on the contemplation of the action of the Holy Spirit in the souls. Those three experiences make us rejoice and hope. This brotherly gaze comes from Cuba. It is a vision of the church from the outskirts. Uh, in Cuba, we had uh, two desert storms that hit the church, unfortunately. One in 1959, when communism came and started persecuting the church openly until uh, 1999, when St. John Paul II came and it was a big change in, the, in, in terms of religious freedom in the island. And the other desert storm was just started just uh, when the door were open because unfortunately the evangelization of the island had been done through bad ways in a certain sense that did not build the church properly. So I wouldn't tell you which is worse. Maybe it's better to be plainly persecuted than to be badly formed. So whenever we obey the church, the spouse of Christ, whenever we do the work of the church, uh, understood as the spouse of Christ, so that mystery, that subject that is beyond time, that is a communion of saints, it is it's a work that always bears fruits. We discovered that the gospel is strong, is powerful, is alive. And that's the, the experience they bring to you from Cuba. You know, the experience of joy of the 72 that came back from the mission. Full of joy because the demons submitted to them. But it's a matter of obedience, whether we obey the Holy Church or not. Whether we, work, we, we make the work of the Church or not. If we make the work of the Church, there will be fruits, abundance of fruit. 
Here in Cuba, we are rebu rebuilding the church around the Most Holy Eucharist, I mean, the communities, the different communities, tiny, commun tiny communities, but lively communities, I would say, made of 10, 20, 30, sometimes 50. So we are rebuilding those communities around the Most Holy Eucharist, so around the grace of God, through the grace of God, and through the teaching, the deposit of the faith, grace and truth, Jesus, we saw his glory. Glory as first born of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is full of grace and truth. When we bring Jesus to people, we bring them grace and truth. And so whenever we bring grace and truth through the Eucharist and the sound teaching, there is the Holy Spirit at work. So we see conversions. We see uh, people willing to be firm, to, to know the faith. We see vocations and people getting married. And this, it makes our heart rejoice. What does it mean? It means that if we want, it depends on us whether there is a crisis or not. It doesn't depend on the circumstances at all. It depends on our fidelity to the Lord, to the gospel. I'm glad to be here, dear brothers and sisters. First of all, I, I apologize whether my English is not perfect or also uh, my speech is not uh, perfectly accurate because when you are in mission, on mission or in mission, um, you don't have much time to, to look after your, your <laughs> studies or memories or things like that. You know, it's true what St. Francis Xavier said, that he didn't have time to, to pray the breviary. That's what he said in, his, in one of his letters, because, you know, people were constantly uh, pressing them in a certain sense. Obviously, we have to make room for the spiritual life, and we do it especially in, in the early mornings. But for sure, we don't have time to, to read that much or to, to study that much, so we... But we are, we are very happy to be servants of the, of the poor, those who are in need of Christ. Now, I'm fe I feel very comfortable here in the United States, and um, whenever I, I come over here, um, it's been now 10 years, um, because my, my superiors told me to come and, and thanks the benef thank the benefactors or visit the monastery and ask for prayers. Sometimes also visit the parishes and, and uh, let people know about the work that we do. So I feel comfortable because I think that you have a sound church, an healthy church, because I also visited many other countries and here there is something very sound, healthy and beautiful happening. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. So I see here uh, strong bishops. I see here sound independence and freedom, solid formation, defenders of life, good priests who love the church, good families open to life. This is not very much common, my dear, but unfortunately. And I think that you took it very seriously, the call to holiness. You lay people, especially the lay people, took it very seriously, the call to holiness of the Second Vatican Council. And also the call to take up the responsibility, your own responsibility in the church, because actually you are the very first missionaries in the church. We are called, we priests are called to form you, and you are called to spread the gospel all of, wherever you are, all over the world, actually. And uh, I think that yours was a modern response to modernism. Because, my dear brothers and sisters, we don't have to be afraid of modernity at all. We have to evangelize. We, we have to make it fruitful because the gospel has the power, because the gospel is, is the power of God, has the power to make modernity beautiful. We don't have to despise or reject modernity because we even use modernity. We are modern men and women, are we? We are modern men and women. But the power of the gospel is able to purify that mentality and to make it, in a certain sense, a modern Christian mentality. 
Now, why did you give that response? I think that you had, you enjoyed two advantages. The first of all, you are sincerely, genuinely religious, I think, generally speaking. And also you enjoy a, an important religious freedom that helped you a lot. Because when you saw the pastor doing crazy things, you just moved from a parish to another. <laughs> and that's all. <laughs> that's very easy. But this is very, it's very American. It's very American. In, in Europe, we don't do that. We stay in the parish where we are, <laughs> suffering from the craziness of the, of the pastors. <laughs> So that's good, that sound. You, 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 you are worried for your faith. And then you are geographically enough far away from Germany and Rome. That's healthy as well. <laughs> <laughs> it helps a lot because all the stress uh, vibration that come from, from those places are in a certain sense absorbed by the distances and you're, you have more independence from that point of view. Think of the poor Italian people <laughs> and pray for us. <laughs> so this is, this is um, uh, what, um, what I want to share with you. We are experiencing a time of cultural crisis in the Western world. We know that it is the fall of an entire civilization. The Christian civilization uh, has been going on for, for centuries now, actually. Uh, shaped by Christian in, as the element of union and synthesis. This is a world with white hair. Faith in God is fading away, and this is bringing about the collapse of the Western civilization. We Catholic should be, would be supposed to sustain the pillars of our world and culture, but the true tragedy of our time is that the Catholics are suffering from a crisis of identity. This is a tremendous crisis of faith, which is the source of our identity. The crisis of the Catholics is acting as an amplifier and an accelerator of the crisis of the Western world. Pope Benedict in 2011 said that the real crisis facing the church in the Western world is a crisis of faith. We have some external factors that may challenge our faith for sure. For example, globalization, encounter with cultures, religions, but wouldn't be a problem if we had a strong identity, for sure. If I see a Muslim, I'm a Catholic, that's fine. I try to evangelize the Muslim, <laughs> and that's all. It's not a problem. Then the other external factor could be secularism and um, materialism. For sure, they challenge our identity because it's a spiritual identity. And they tend to make us worldly and focus it on material things. But if your faith is strong, obviously, you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't have any problem. You would focus on, on the things from above, like St. Paul says. And then globalism, the new Marxism, the attempt to eliminate all identities in order to create a global market, made up consumering and producing unities with fluid identities, interchangeable identities, so inexisting identity to be easily manipulated and controlled. We know about that. So, but the external factors that could challenge our faith are not the problem. The problem is the internal factor that brought about the falsification of the, of the doctrine. In a most famous speech of December 2005, Pope Benedict described the years after the Second Vatican Council using a quotation from St. Basil describing what happened after the Council of Nicaea. The raucous shouting of those who through disagreement, rise up against one another, the incomprehensible chatter, the confused din of uninterrupted clamoring has now filled almost the whole church, the whole of the church, falsifying through excess or failure. And it's true that there has been, there had been a falsification through excess or failure, the right doctrine of the church, of the faith. Then Pope Benedict said, 
we do not want to apply precisely this dramatic description it is always very humble. I would apply this dramatic description. To the situation of the post-conciliar period, yet something from all that occurred is nevertheless reflected in it. The right doctrine of the faith after the Second Vatican Council has been falsified and is currently being falsified nowadays. It doesn't mean that the deposit of the faith of the Church is not clear. This is the mind of Christ. It is perfectly clear. clear. But it has been falsified while taught, celebrated, and preached. This brought about the crisis of the Catholics and also amplified the crisis of the Christian societies because, as Saint, um, uh, the Holy Curie of Ars used to say, stop preaching the gospel for 10 years in a village and they will adore the beasts. That's what happened in our societies. People are adoring the beasts because the Catholic, Catholics are in trouble. If we wouldn't be in trouble, they wouldn't adore the beasts. Dear brothers and sisters, in my opinion, then if you want, we can talk about that anywhere. We are facing the worst crisis of faith ever in the church. There are people who minimize that. But this is naive. Why is, why is it the worst crisis of the faith ever? Because it is not only one aspect of the faith that has been falsified, but it is the faith as a whole that has been poisoned because the poison has been the way we approach the, fel the faith as a whole. Now, the poison of the faith as a whole is now openly identifiable as modernism. Well, I don't know what's your experience, but at least in Europe, this word is not very much used. You know, people think that this word is, uh, belongs to the traditionalists, and it's just the prejudice of the traditionalists that use that in order to follow their ways in a certain sense. But we have to be honest, and I think that this word belongs to the vocabulary of the church, because it's a word that actually uh, Pope St. Pius X created in a certain sense. And called modernism the sum of all heresies. That's why it affects the faith as a whole. That poisons the whole deposit of the faith. So, well, I don't know whether you are afraid or not, but I would just say do not be afraid to use that word because we have to clarify what the problem is. So, what is modernity and what is modernism? We have to know about that because, as I said before, uh, modernity with its limits and virtues lives in us. We have been formed as modern people. Most of us, uh, maybe some of us have been formed in different ways, but most of us have been formed this way. And also we are called to evangelize a modern or a postmodern man. We cannot abandon the modern world at all. The solution is not to run away from that. It's not to run away. Maybe we run away in order to reorganize the weapons and then we go back fighting in the battle hmm? because we trust the power of the gospel and we are ready to die for Jesus, aren't we? <laughs> we are ready to die for Jesus. So modernity has got a positive and a negative meaning. The positive aspect of modernity describes a new cultural confident approach to reality that brought about a time of development of men's intellectual talents never seen before in the scientific field. But not only that, a renovated rational approach of reality that brought an increase of knowledge and would have brought a deepening in the intelligence of faith if the, the thinking would, uh, wouldn't be separated from faith. It, is, it was an opportunity that got lost as a whole to, to live a positive modernity in a certain sense. It was possible another modernity. That's what the experts say. I agree with them. But this is not the main line that developed. The main line that developed was the negative aspect. That is uh, the absolutization of human reason by making of it an idol 
absolute, you know, worshipped in the French Revolution as a goddess reason. The discovery of the experimental method in science made man capable to know nature's law and fostered in him a sense of omnipotence by experiencing his power over nature. They made him consider God superfluous. The experimental method established the victory of arts over nature. A modern philosopher considered themselves adults. It is a sign of intellectual maturity to abandon God and all kinds of religion, which is considered a primitive state of life, a pre-scientific state of life due to ignorance. We know that God got must marginalize from the human thinking first by the philo French philosopher Descartes. Kant considered him just an hypothesis that sustained uh, the practical reason, the moral. Hegel ended up identifying God with man's spirit. And eventually, um, God was completely eliminated or considered a psychological consolation of people that don't um, whose, whose brain don't work very well. <laughs> this paved way to atheism for sure. I won't, I won't enter into the, those issues, just mentioning. The main assertion of uh, uh, modernity, you know, as, as it is, reason and knowledge are limited to the empirical data. Human knowledge is limited to what is visible, to what appears as a phenomenon. It is not possible for human reason, according to those people, to go beyond what is visible and so reach out any visible truth. Truth itself doesn't exist objectively. It is human reason that creates truth itself by ordaining what is visible, the phenomenon. Science is the only reliable language, uh, knowledge, sorry, in language. <laughs> Reason is the measure of all things. Faith and religion must be relegated to the private sphere. The major feature of modern man is optimism conceived as a dogmatic certainty, relied on the capacity of science and technique to solve any problem or question without God or the Bible, revelation. Everything but man's reason is put under methodic doubt Reality is created by human intelligence, shaped at least by human intelligence. This is idolism, the sin of modern men. I can see idolism working in people, in the church also, very much so. This is the rebellion against reality as such, the lost authority left, however having eliminated political or religious authorities. You must remember the famous the famous phrases, cogito ergo sum, I think that I am, everything real is rational, everything rational is real. Now, what is modernism then? This is modernity. Now, what is modernism? Modernism is a modern approach to the faith in this way, thinking that, that reason is everything, thinking that reason is the only way to know what exists, thinking that we shape the reality. So if you approach the mystery of God that has a visible aspect and an invisible aspect, if you approach the plan of God that always has a human aspect and a divine aspect, because the mystery of God, the plan of God is always sacramental. There are two aspects working together. What would you be left with, with the human aspect and the soul? You would, leave, you would lose the invisible aspect. And that's what happened. We have lost what is divine in the mystery. We have lost what comes from God in the mystery. And what are we left with that rationalist approach? We are left with nature, Madonna, not a sound nature. We are, lost, we are left with what is visible, what is human, let's say, but it is not a sound humanity. It, we are left with something that needs to be restored, that has in itself uh, the, 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 the dynamic that brings that to um, destruction in a certain sense, or delusion, because it's, it's the original sin. That's why 
secularized people, secularized parishes, secularized societies, secularized uh, religious institutes, secularized um, nations are going to disappear from the, I mean, from the point of view of the faith. We see it in Germany. Those who visit Germany, those who visit uh, England, those who visit Fran France, and then little by little my country as well. That's the reality. The vocation of, the, of secularization is dissolution. Vocation of modern, modernism is dissolution. Is that an English word, dissolution? Yeah, thank you. So the whole deposit of faith has been secularized, deprived of this invisible aspect. Can you think about that? The whole deposit of faith has been thought in a modernist way, secularizing it, lowering it at the worldly level. What is the church? The church is, is a group of people. The church is a group of people, it's not the mystical body of Christ. What is the Eucharist? The Eucharist is the, the, the memory we remember, the Last Supper. You know that the effect is just the same as Protestantism. Because, well, we'll see why. St. Bernard says that when cooperation ceases, ceases, grace ceases. Grace is given in, 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 in the cooperation. So modernists cannot accept the existence of miracles, angels, original sin, divinity of Jesus, heaven, hell, inspiration of scriptures, virginal maternity, resurrection, most holy trinity, what is left. Faith itself in nothing supernatural is a manifestation of human desires of, of infinite. Jesus is a symbol of God. This was the title of, of a, a famous book in the 80s, I think, or 90s. Among the religious orders today, evangelization consists in promoting human values because they think that by educating people on a human level, they would be saved because they have a secularized concept of salvation. What is salvation? Salvation is growing in our human skills, human relationships, you know, human development. Sisters of St. Joseph, 20 years educating in values, workshops for human development. The sisters of poor sisters of St. Joseph, they were called to evangelize, and now they are stuck into educating in values. That's secularization of the, of the evangelization. We can think of liberation theology as well. We can think of the fall of the missionary work of the church, that today when you think of missionary work, what do you, would you think? People that go out and build, people that go out and do things. You wouldn't think of people that go and give the whole life in order to bring the faith to those who don't have the faith. This is secularized understanding of the mission of the church. Obviously there are poor they need things for sure, but this is a different thing from the mission of the church. In our diocese, uh, Caritas, Diocesan Caritas, has projects, and they ask us, we do not obey, obviously, uh, they ask us to separate catechesis from those projects. So for example, we, we bring some toys to the, knee, to the, to the kids or, or things like that. They don't want us to, to tell them about the Lord because we are just working on their human level. Anyway, this is, my dear brothers and sisters, known or must be, must be named Smoke of Satan. This is the Smoke of Satan which St. Paul, uh, Paul VI was referring to, why do I say that? Because when he talks about the smoke of Satan, he refers 
explicitly, openly to the modern, to, to modernism, to that methodic doubt that poisons the faith. In fact, he said in 1972, through some crack, the smoke of Satan has entered the temple of God. In fact, smoke brings confusion, lack of air, lack of clarity. It is also a sign that something is, is going wrong. And he refers explicitly to doubt. Doubt entered our consciences through the windows that were supposed to bring in light. From science, that is supposed to bring us truth that don't make us separate from God, but make us search for him and celebrate him more intensively, came about criticism and doubt. Scientists teach. I don't know. We don't know. We cannot know. This is the methodic doubt of Descartes. That's why modernism is the smoke of Satan, unfortunately. One would have thought that after the council there would have been a sunny day for the history of the church. Instead, a day of clouds, storm, darkness, uncertainty came. The devil came to poison the fruits of the Second Vatican Council. And so keep the church from bursting forth into the hymn of joy of having refreshed in her self-awareness. So Descartes also says, I heard it on, over, over a talk from a philosopher, well, this is very well known, that he, he starts finding uh, the most certain knowledge, no? and they say, in order to find the, the, the most certain knowledge, the knowledge from which I cannot doubt at all, I have to doubt from, even from reality. And he says, there could be an evil genius that is uh, um, cheating me, presenting me something that exists, and it doesn't exist. Who is the evil genius? The evil genius behind that is the devil that made us think idealistically, made, made us lose the contact with reality. Now, it is very interesting, my dear brothers and sisters, that Our Lady came here to this world of the past uh, 150 years. Um, inviting us to conversion. And this is not a chance. This is not a chance. This crisis has been prophesied by Our Lady, inviting us to conversion. Why did Our Lady invite us to conversion? Because conversion is the only way to come out of it. Because the philosophers say that modern, modernism in itself has no way out. And I could see it very clearly. You can see it very clearly. Because it is an ideology. It is a set of ideas made an idol to which people kneel and adore. I could see it in Cuba very clearly, because communism is another ideology. It's another idol. From communism, the only way to come out is conversion. Because people are blinded completely blinded from a, that ideology. So people see in Cuba uh, broken streets, there is no medicine, there are no medicines, there is no food, people get uh, $20 a month as a salary, one, one million, five, five, one, one and a half million people left the country over the past two years in order to find a place, a normal place where to live, you know? And in spite of that, people still stay with communism. This is a blindness, complete blindness. One friend of mine told me the way he opened up his eyes. He went on a trip to, to Canada because he, he's an architect, an important architect down there. And when he came back, he, he, he realized that everything was completely false because he saw the reality. It was a conversion for him. And he, he kept crying the whole week, one, uh, the whole, uh, an entire week crying because he got completely, um, how do you say, uh, cheated? I don't know. Anyway, you understood. And uh, what happens with, with modernism is right the same. 
people see there are no vocations. The priests leave the priesthood. The religious institute uh, have no vocation. And you know, the crisis of, of, the, of the Catholics. Uh, people don't go to Mass and everything is fine. Everything is fine. Nothing is wrong. They are blind. And the only way out is conversion. So we have to pray for them. We have to offer sacrifices for them. And for us as well, because sometimes we are also falling in the same blindness. And this, so there is a, 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 a connection between the invitation of Our Lady uh, to conversion and the time that we are living in. So the consequence of modernity, we know, is postmodernity. Postmodernity is called the, the effect, the fruit of, of um, modernity, because modernity didn't, didn't eventually keep the promise of happiness and, uh, and development on human level, especially. So, postmodernity is the disenchantment for modern illusion, but without humility. It means that modernity failed, we accept the, con the bad consequences of modernity as they are. The same happens in the church. There are people that theorize that and even, even try to find the reason for the collapse of the Catholics. And they want to keep it as it is because they don't have the humility to say something went wrong. You know, they say, for example, oh, it is normal that religious institutes were born, they grow, they become adult, and then they die. So don't worry about that. You don't have vocations. It's normal. It is normal. It's a normal process of life. This is a self, an attempt to convince themselves that they are right. In, my, in the parish that I serve, it is beautiful, and it's, it's related with, with what I'm going to say then, that we are, we are celebrating, my, we are not pushing people to, to celebrate in a, different, or in a more reverent way. We normally celebrate the Mass as, 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 we, as much as, as, we, as, as, as reverent as we can. And we didn't tell them to kneel during the Eucharistic prayer. And they started kneeling. They started kneeling during the Eucharistic prayer. We didn't tell them to receive the communion in the, in the, on the tongue. And they start kneeling and receive the communion on the tongue. Because they, they are seeing the altar boys. Now, the only one who don't receive communion on the tongue and don't kneel, who are the nuns? The nuns of the parish, unfortunately, because they are convinced that Jesus is risen, and so we cannot kneel before him. Okay, that's the reason, because there is always rationalism behind that, behind modernism. There is an absolutization, absolutization of, of the human thinking. Eh? Okay, so it is, it is strange, very strange. Anyway, postmodernity, the fruit of modernity is, you, we know, nihilism. Everything is meaningless. Life is without objective meaning, purpose of intrinsic value. Relativism, there is no objective in binding truth in any aspect of human life. This brought about fragmentation of many people's life, individualism and human relationships. Experience has become all important. Lack of commitment, insecurity, conformism with worldly mentalities, existential anguish, that's the fruit of, of the bad modernity, um, of a man without God. And, but we can see also postmodernity into the church. We can see that existential anguish, that lack of commitment, that experience that has become all important, that fragmentation, that individualism among the Catholics, in the Catholic communities, because the, the person is the same. We have been poisoned by. Um, modernism, our faith has been poisoned. Now, the church 
even if the Catholics are in crisis, the church is not in crisis. You cannot identify the Catholic with the church because the church is a, a, a mystical reality. It is not just a, a, a social reality, you know? The church is holy and cannot be in crisis at all. The church enjoys the promise of the indefectibility. The visible church will never disappear. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. Moving forward through trial and tribulation, the church is strengthened by the power of God's grace, which was promised to her by the Lord, so that in the weakness of the flesh she may not waver from perfect fidelity, but remain a bride worthy of the, her Lord. And moved by the Holy Spirit may never cease to renew herself until through the cross she arrives at the light which knows no setting, Lumen Gentium 9. St. Ambrose, the church is like a boat, constantly agitated by storms and waves, but that can never ever be wrecked because its main mast is the cross of Christ. Its salesman is the Father, the guardian of its prow is the Holy Spirit, and its throwers the Apostle. It is interesting to me that the Pope is not mentioned in this quotation because, well, the Pope is a person. He, he, he is not infallible in everything he does. So the Church is established on the cross of Christ, on its helmet is the Father, the Guardian is the Holy Spirit, and there are ours, there are ours, the Apostles. The church will waver if its foundation wavered, but how could Christ waver? As long as Christ doesn't waver, the church will not ever waver, St. Augustine. So uh, we are here not to complain, my dear brothers and sisters. We don't want just to cope with the circumstances because we are Catholics. We are disciples of the Lord. We are not, uh, we, we, we boast of it by the grace of God. So we are here to stir up hope and commitment to the, go to the gospel. St. Augustine, when the Roman Empire was falling down, invited people to live out in the circumstances in which were, they were called to live as Catholics, and not to complain because the Roman Empire was falling down, because it was a big shock, for even for the Catholics, because eventually Eventually, Catholicism was the religion, the official religion of the Roman Empire. So it was a shock for them. But we are invited to live in a holy way, in an apostolic way, our faith wherever we are in any time we are living in. L living one's faith in Jesus is becoming increasingly difficult in a social, cultural, a cultural setting inside and outside the church in which the faith is constantly changed, challenged and threatened. All attempts to affirm the existence of a truth in the society, valid and binding truth for everybody is pointed out as fundamentalism. In the church is the same. All attempts to affirm the existence of the truth of the deposit of faith in the perennial tradition of the church is also pointed out as fundamentalism as a threat for the church, a danger for the church. Tertullian said that truth engenders hate, and the more sincerely confessed, the more offense. We are not the sort of people who draw back and, lost by, and are lost by it. We are the sort who keep faith until our souls are saved. Hebrew 10.39. What Christianity needs when it is hated by the world, it is not persuasive words, but greatness of soul, St. Ignatius of Antioch. We have to know, we need to know who we are in order to live it out. The true renewal of the church is to ask what is a Christian and not what does the world want. We should wonder about who we are and we, do, we should ask ourselves, as St. Gregory is Nassianzen, what is this mystery that surrounds me? It is of particular importance that all Christians be aware that through baptism they have received an extraordinary dignity. Today we are called to, um, to transform this modern world. We can transform the modern world because the gospel is, is, is strong. Maybe 
it will be asked the sacrifice of our life, but it is worth it. How many martyrs died in order to transform, uh, the, the, in order to build up the Christian civilization, you know? We can show to the modern man, we can make him wonder about the beauty, about how reasonable is our faith. That's why we have to know our faith and to tell them the reason of our faith so that they wonder how beautiful it is. How many conversions there have been for deepening into the faith, into the beauty of the Catholic faith. We are to make wonder the modern man about the beauty of the celebration of the faith because it is a shock when they see the beauty of God coming out of a worthy celebration of the faith. And we have to help out the broken postmodern men to find love in our fraternities. That's why they have to, to find in us true brotherly uh, fraternities. Once I was in a seminary, in the seminary, when I was in the seminary, we were uh, um, at lunch, and uh, a man came in, a man came in, just uh, at lunch, and when he saw us, there was a group of 10, maybe 15 young people eating, and then he started crying. What did he start crying? It was a moment of conversion for them, for him, because he, he saw people that were loving each other, people that were happy, people that had clear eyes. So this is a, a, an occasion of conversion for the broken, postmodern man. 